There we are. That was meant to be for the bit while you were sort of sitting down and that kind of thing and taking your coat off. Hello. I'm David Godler. Thank you very much for coming to this thing. <laughs> it's a cold December night, probably. It's not that bad, actually, is it? Um, but thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. It's nice to see so many people turning out for this. Got me disco lights, bought them on Amazon yesterday. $30 for two. I'm not on commission. It's quite good. Um, so, welcome. I do appreciate you all coming. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the land. Um, I don't do the written down land acknowledgement, which my colleague Michael Dockstetter tells me is all wrong anyway. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we are here on stolen land and there were treaties which the colonizers did not abide by. They talk about peace and love and all those nice things. We didn't really do that. So, but we are here on this land and we acknowledge that. That was the acknowledgement bit. This talk is cool. Creativity is a thing that you do. Um, what I'm going to do is, there's some bits of talking and there's some bits of music. And in fact, it's what it said at the start. There's talking, bit of music, five diagrams, and a Q&A. So that's variety. There's also cheese. Well, I'll tell you about all the things that are happening in the room. Uh, there's cheese and things you can eat and drink including alcoholic drink over there. There's some more cheese and things like that over there. And there's a guy from the university bookstore very generously selling the book at something like a 20% or more discount. And you can have a bonus CD if you want one. So there we go. That's all the stuff about what's happening in the room. Um, creativity is a thing that you do. So this is a talking bit for starters. It's quite common to think of creativity as an amount of juice that you may or may not have. That's one of the ways that psychologists still like to talk about it. And it's kind of a common assumption. We talk, don't we, as you know, about this person's really creative. I don't feel so creative. They've got a lot of creativity. I haven't got so much that way of thinking about it. Um, I think that's quite wrong. That's not really how creativity works. Creativity is a thing that you do. So if there's somebody who you see who's been, you would say, oh, they're really creative. What we actually mean is they've spent an amount of time doing creative stuff. And, you know, we appreciate that they've spent that time doing creative stuff. They have done creative stuff. They've done well because they put a lot of time into it. But it's a choice. Creativity is a thing that you choose to do, basically. Obviously, it's a privilege. Some people have more time available to them to do creative things. Other people find it more of a struggle. But all of us can find some slices of time to do creativity but it's the choice that you make to spend some time doing the thing. That's like the main point of all of this. <laughs> um, so now, what is a good way to spend time? I put this down because you've all come here to spend like an hour or so with me on this, and I'm glad that you came. The number of hours that I've spent preparing this thing, don't bear thinking about, um, partly because I'm playing music live for the first time in my life, which is also a... <laughs> yeah, but that's a silly thing to do when you've got lots of people who you like and want to impress. Um, I should have practiced first or something, but I thought, well, this would be, uh, you know... It's good to expose yourself to unexpected things and things that make you feel a bit nervous. That is how to move yourself forward creativity, creatively, I would say. So um, I'm doing a bit of that. Um, and music in general, right? I was thinking about me making music, and a thing that's very obvious is that nobody's asked me to do that, and there is essentially no demand. And that's fine, I quite like that. And <laughs> well, thank you. But I'm, I'm quite happy to lean into that. Normally, I've, I've tried to do things that people might actually want. Because, <laughs> um, you know, that seems sensible. Um, in this case, I'm okay with it uh, not necessarily being something that somebody wants because I thought, I had a thought, which was that basically it's like turning up with a basket of cakes and they're nice cakes and you've spent a lot of time making the cakes, but you've arrived on a planet that's already made of beautiful cakes. So that, that's what it's like. <laughs> um, there's no particular need for me to be doing it, but. Uh, the reason for me doing it is just to explore something that is an act of creativity, 
to get more into the creative process, doing something unfamiliar because I hadn't made music before and then I thought I would, because you can. Um, and potentially to expose oneself to humiliation, doubt and shame. <laughs> uh, because they're always fun feelings, aren't they? So, <laughs> so that's good. Um, live music, right? So it's the thing where I did actually, I made some music in the form of recordings, essentially. The reason I started making music is because I worked out that essentially you're making what adds up to a digital file inside a computer. And I've made digital files inside computers before, so that was okay. Um, I'd done websites and visual things and always things you looked at, I didn't do anything with sound. Um, that's why I thought it'd be interesting to do something with sound, because it's different. Um, but having devoted many hours to creating recorded sound, I then put it out, and David McFarlane, who's there, sitting here, there he is, hi David, I'm glad you came. He's also a musician, or, or he's a musician. Um, and, and he said, oh, you'd be playing some like gigs. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. I've just spent hundreds of hours creating recorded works. I understand for some of you, especially the kind of Canadian singer-songwriter kind of principle, and if you've got a guitar and you sing a song, you can record that. And so the act of recording is very similar to, not the same as, but similar to the act of performing it somewhere. So fine, that makes sense. The kind of thing I do, which is very carefully assembled over many, many hours in a computer and using bits of electronic hardware and stuff, um, the idea of performing it is like, it's just a totally different thing. And I think it's really interesting that we, we don't really think about that, do we? There's the thing where if anybody makes music, you're like, well, when are you gonna do a concert? It seems to make sense. But they're very different things, making recorded music and performing music. Um, I had some thoughts about this. Uh, the, my series of thoughts relating to this were, one, in 1985, when I was 14 years old, in the NME, I read a review of Tears for Fears playing live. Uh, the NME was kind of sniffy about pop bands anyway. And they said it was rubbish because it sounded just like on the record. And my 14-year-old brain was like, oh, that's interesting. So they played like, it, it sounded just like the record, and that's what the enemy thought was bad. So obviously live music is meant to be different to that. So that was an interesting bit of learning. Um, also, of course, if you can think of 1980s incredibly well-produced music that's really, you know, they spent many, 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 many hours making those recorded works, and then if they were able to perform those things live, um, well then that's amazing anyway. Like, if, if they sounded even similar, that, that's an achievement. But it was not seen as an achievement, it was seen as a source of shame and bad stuff. Um, so there was that. Then I went to see the All Seeing Eye. You won't know who the All Seeing Eye are, but they were this Sheffield band and we drove a long way to see the All Seeing Eye in Sheffield in England, where I lived, um, in the late 90s. And the All Seeing Eye were this band who'd made um, sort of this sample-based music with lots of guest vocalists. And I thought, how are they going to be able to do this live? And what they did live was amazing. It was just these crazy people tearing up the stage and making lots of great noise. It was nothing like what the old thing I were like on a record. And that was fine. I enjoyed it. It was like, oh, that, that was an interesting experience too. Totally disconnected things. And then also the experience of seeing the Chemical Brothers on more than one occasion, again in the UK, in big kind of halls and stadiums and things, where what you've got is basically like two guys appearing to bounce up and down behind some desks and occasionally like seeming to turn a knob or something. And you think, what are they like, what, what's happening? <laughs> in terms of, I mean, it sounded good, but in terms of performed music, were they doing anything? Were they pretending when they did like that? Was that a thing? Did that make any difference to the experience? Or was they just, did they basically press start at the beginning and that was that? Um, <laughs> all this builds up to, um, no, one more point. The, well, the one more point is, in 1991, I remember Chris Lowe from the Pet Shop Boys, I love the Pet Shop Boys, and so does Geneva Hines, who's very kindly doing the drinks today. Um, Chris Lowe from the Pet Shop Boys, when they're on tour in the US, explaining in press conferences again and again and again that um, Chris himself was playing some of the parts, but the other parts were being played by computers, and he explained all the technicalities about that. And on every occasion, the next day in the press, it would say, the music's all on tape. Uh, the music is not on tape, but the computer is playing music and music all on tape uh, is perhaps hard to distinguish. All of that builds up to what I'm doing when I'm doing this. So I'd already made various recorded tracks, right? I think it helps to know what's happening. 
I'm sort of explaining what's happening. Um, and then in my hours of preparation for this, I've basically deconstructed all of those tracks into what are basically loops and samples, which are now inside that golden box. Um, and so then in terms of me playing live, I'm playing live because I'm triggering things. So you'll think he's not playing live because he's not like playing notes or strumming a guitar or something, and I'm not doing that. Um, and I can't believe that anybody would ever do that because how could, that's so brave. Like, <laughs> does anybody do that? Some of you here probably do that. I think, oh, goodness me. Um, th th this is quite enough for me. But so it's like all of the parts are separate parts and I could trigger any of the parts. So any of the things I do could be like one minute long or six hours long if anybody had an appetite for that. Don't worry, I know you don't. But um, I'm triggering bits, which I think is quite stressful enough for anybody. Um, and so I'll do the first one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I've not done that before. Um, <laughs> uh, obviously, I'm going to have to work on my showmanship because watching a bald man staring at a box and anxiously pressing buttons isn't. I mean, that is actually, that's literally a thing that people pay to see, but not, not in this case that I understand. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so I told you I've got a mix of things. We're doing okay. Right. So that was that. Um, why do people make things? Why am I making things? Um, I think it's to do with a lot of the time it's um, somebody wanting to kind of say, here I am, 
I made this. Putting a thing out into the world, sharing it with people, whether they ask for it or not. Um, seeking to make a connection. That's what we're all doing, I think. Um, in the book, which I'm launching today, um, it contains uh, a range of voices, because I'm aware that we don't really want to be adding another, another middle-aged white man to the pile of people telling you what to do. I completely understand that. Um, so I tried to stir in a range of other people, and in part of my life, I'm trying to give a platform to other people and people who don't look like me to have a voice and to say things, um, which is useful. In this case, I'm not doing that at all. As you can see, it's just me doing my stupid stuff for an evening. Um, I like the thing for, I mean, Janelle Monet says lots of nice things. Here's a, a bit of Janelle Monet, which is quoted in the book, um, where she's, she's talking about how she's always wanting to, she's always thinking about uh, the black girl or the queer boy who feel kind of excluded and not part of things. She says, I'm always thinking about that young girl or young boy who doesn't quite know if people are going to understand them. I'm always thinking about those people first. I like that. And in my favorite book of 2021, um, Legacy Russell, she did a book called Glitch Feminism. She's talking about how she grew up as a also queer black girl in New York, um, not wealthy and increasingly being pushed out by gentrification and so on. Um, and when she was 12 in 1996 or seven, um, she went online and found the whole world of amazing things where she could explore all kinds of identity and do all of that stuff that we used to talk about in the 1990s where you could do anything online and be anybody and connect with all kinds of people. And that was terribly exciting. Um, these days, of course, we're more cynical about the internet and worry about it. And we know that it's a platform for all kinds of things that we probably wish weren't happening. Um, what I really like about Legacy Versal is she's trying to get back up that excitement that we used to have because you don't have to be using the big platforms that uh, you know, dominate our lives and do surveillance and help people do abuse and bullying. We can still recapture and make use of all of the potential of digital media culture, which I think is exciting. Um, and she also points to the fact that like, there's these kind of boorish white middle-aged men these days saying, oh, you don't want to be using the internet and giving you all of the critiques of the internet and telling you what's wrong with it. All of those critiques are basically right, but at the same time, it can be such a vibrant space for all kinds of people and giving voices to lots of different kinds of people. And we need to be able to reclaim that, I guess. Um, the next musical track that I did, basically the first one, that was Proximity Effect. That can kind of go anyhow, depending on what I press. And the third one, October, is also like that. This one's a bit more ready-made because it's too complicated for me to do much with. But, um, but it does have some, I can, I can vary and press buttons. Uh, so this track's called Frozen Berlin, and it's possibly the most melodious and least upsetting. <laughs> um, when I get that far, let me load that in. Ding, 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 ding. Okay. <laughs> right, let me decide what button to press first.
sky. Everything, everything. Thank you. This is the very definition of a captive audience. If you don't like this kind of music, then I'm sorry, but what can you do? Um, right. I did promise five diagrams. Five diagrams! Okay. People who came here for the diagrams, now's the exciting time. Um, of course. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and it's one of those things where you set yourself a thing to do, and then so a, about a week ago, I thought I'd better work out what the diagrams are. I already knew which one of the diagrams was. It was this one. Um, which uh, students from my Your Creative Self course will have seen before because it's my, the one thing that obsesses me most. Um, when you're making anything, so this is addressed to any of you as makers of anything. Um, like when you're making anything, you know at the start that it's not going to be for everybody in the whole world because not everybody in the whole world likes the kind of thing that you like to make. And you think that's fine and good. And maybe you even think, oh, I'll be kind of experimental, or I'll lean into a particular kind of thing that I want to do. And you already know at the start, you definitely know not everybody's going to like that thing, but there's a particular bunch of people who you want to like that thing, and maybe they'll like that thing. That's the kind of people you're looking for. Everybody else, it's not for them. And they don't like that kind of thing anyway, so you don't need to worry about them. But the problem is, of course, as you probably know, when you've made a thing, then you completely forget that, and you meet one of the people who's you're bound to meet, look, all, all this, there's loads of those people. You meet one of those people that doesn't like that thing that you do, um, and, and you, like, you show them your thing and see if they're interested, and they're like, mm. and you feel really upset and heartbroken because they didn't like your thing. But they weren't meant to like your thing. It's not for them. Everything, as you know, like everything, like if you think about the kind of music that you like best, not everybody likes that music. That's fine. 
Maybe your best friend doesn't like the kind of music that you like, and maybe you, you wish they did or something, but you understand everybody's different. Fine. But one thing is, so not everybody likes everything, but you knew that from the start. <laughs> and it's really important to hold on to that, because it's so hard to, it's like it's so easy to forget. You make the thing thinking, not everybody's going to like it. I'll make it just for these people who are going to love this kind of thing. That's a good plan. It's fine. I mean, everybody does that. Once you've made it, well, then you meet one or two people that don't like the thing, and you think, oh, my God, this is terrible. Why did I make this thing? Nobody likes it. But that's not the point. You've completely missed your own point. Your own point was, at the start, those people. All you need to do is find those people. And it's not everybody. It's just a smallish bunch of people. But that's OK, because like, if, like, if it's as many as 10%, there's 8 billion people in the world, so I'm no good at maths. But 10%, that's a lot. You don't need to worry about the others. And we always worry about the others and feel upset when the others don't like our stuff. But we shouldn't because of that. So that was my first diagram. And that was the only one I could think of doing. But then I thought of some other ones. Um, in this diagram, this is about being unique, right? Because you kind of feel that when you're making stuff, you want to be unique. You don't want to be the same as everybody else. So the yellow rectangle represents everything in the world of culture in the world. That's quite a lot of things. Um, but then within that, there's stuff you love, which is there. And then what should you be aiming for when you're making the stuff? You might think you should go bam right into the middle of the kind of thing that you already love. So you already love a particular kind of music. You already love a particular kind of painting or sculpture or whatever. And you could aim for bam doing exactly what those people do which it's natural to do. And often, like, if you experience something made by other people, and it's great, you think, oh, like, how did they do that? I want to do that. And for a shortish moment, you think, oh, yeah, I've got to work out how to do that and do that. But you don't want to do that, because they're already doing that, and they're already doing it really well. You already noticed that they're doing it really well. That's why you wanted to do it, too. But that's why it's a mistake to try to aim for that. What you should aim for is just a bit off to the side of the stuff that you love. So you're being influenced, perhaps, or inspired by the people who make the stuff that you like. But you don't want to make the same stuff as them, because they're already doing that, and they're doing it well. So you want to do the stuff off to the side. And also, side projects. Um, I only had this thought about a week ago. But the value of side projects, right, part of it is the pressure is taken off them because they're side projects. So you don't worry about them so much. And then you might do your best work on the side projects, because they're side projects, so you didn't worry about them so much. And therefore, you feel more free, and you don't feel constrained. Uh, and you can experiment and do something that seems a bit weird. And we always love the things that are a bit weird. We don't like the things that are kind of like, yeah, it's nice, but it's normal. That's not what you want. You don't want the normal things. You want the things that are actually experimental and interesting and strange. So um, that's why it's good to be, A, not going right for the heart of that, but being off to the side, and also doing side projects where you're not even expecting them to be anything like any of the other things, and that works. Uh, a thing that comes up in the book a lot is about, well, in the book it's a lot about process and about appreciating the time that you spend doing a thing and the care and love that goes into a thing and not so much the end products. And of course we like the end products and we enjoy the end products, but it really is always a journey, not a destination. And I read a thing, um, it wasn't about creativity, it was about activism, but I thought it's actually the same as the creative journey. The journey of activists wanting to bring about change in the world is that you picture a better world, like you picture a world that's like magically great, and everybody's just like really nice, and everybody's nice to everybody, and it's all wonderful, and that is the goal. You never reach that goal. I found it quite upsetting when I read this. I'm like, oh, really? You know. <laughs> But if you think about it, of course, you're never actually going to get to the actual like paradise world of wonderfulness where everybody's just beautifully nice to each other all the time. That's not quite going to happen. Because you know it wouldn't. You've seen the world. We want it to get better. You're not actually going to arrive at the paradise. So it's always a journey, not a destination. And every bit of the journey is important. And we can treat it with love and care and try to make things better in little details as well as big plans. But it's always going to be a journey. You're not going to get to the final thing. So the important thing is doing your best along the way, basically. And similarly for creativity, you're never going to achieve the ultimate thing that you might ever wish to create because you know that's not going to happen anyway. And that doesn't matter. The important thing is what happens along the way. And so also, incidentally, 
This tells us about the role of the artist, the role of the artist in society. That's the kind of thing that we used to worry about in like the 1950s or something before the world became too upsetting. Um, what is the role of the artist in society? On the one hand, it is to create the works, putting some works on the landscape, finished works that we can admire and enjoy. Um, but actually, that's not the role of the artist. It's nice to have those things. But the role of the artist is to be on that journey doing the thing. What is great about artists in society is that they exist. And it can't be entirely about sitting in cafes and smoking because then you wouldn't get the finished works. But we've got to have, got to have some of them. But just the fact of existing and raising questions and making people sort of wonder about the world, that is why we appreciate artists in the world. And so I think it's quite nice for artists because you, you can do quite a bit of the cafe smoking thing. And also be contributing by asking those questions and being there. Also in the book, there's a whole, uh, what would it be called? It, go, it goes through a series of phases trying to wrangle with that idea of 10,000 hours, which you may have wrangled with yourself. Who's heard of the idea of 10,000 hours? You all know the 10,000 ideas thing. Who can tell me what the 10,000 hours <laughs> idea thing is? I can't even say it. Exactly, yeah. Mastery of a thing in 10,000 hours. Um, which on the one hand, it's like, oh, okay, fair enough. You have to work at a thing to get good at a thing. Fine. But have you done the maths on this? This is a nightmare. Um, <laughs> like, I literally had an example in the book a bit earlier before I got to this point, which was about if you dedicated three hours a week to doing your thing, then over the course of a year, well then, you know, three hours a week, We've all got really busy lives, I know. We've all got different kinds of responsibilities and stuff going on. Three hours a week would seem great to carve out three hours a week. Oh, I was talking about it in the first place to say you should stick to it as a sort of just a straightforward creativity tip. Um, like fix it in the calendar like Tuesdays, four till seven. Treat it the same as if you were going to have coffee with a friend or something, which you wouldn't skip just because you had other stuff going on. So you do that. And then that's a really good thing to have that set out bit of time. But um, three hours a week for a year, that's 150 hours. Um, and so 10 years of that, 1,500. You're going to be like, you have to live to be about 160 before you can get anywhere near that. Um, and so then that just seems really kind of punishing and harsh and like, well, I'm never going to achieve that. So was there any point? And all of that. And it seems kind of exclusionary. It's like you imagine the kind of artistic elite has set up this idea to basically tell you to forget it and there's no point because you're not going to have done that. Um, and what I ended up saying about this was this. My recommendation to you and to myself is to focus not on daunting amounts of should, but to enjoy the here and now moments of doing and creating because that is the only important thing, the actual doing of it. Like, you know, when it, that sort of, I get, it's again, it's like the, the thing that you're meant to arrive at at the end of the long, long journey. After 10,000 hours, you get, well, for one thing is you're going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> having, having done the math, unless we live to be 160, you're not really going to be able to enjoy it. Um, the doing of it is the only thing. It's literally the only thing. You can enjoy that journey and take pride in the things that you've done along the way. Trying to do the 10,000 hours is very hard. There is a bit in my meandering about this where I say, for one thing, 10,000 hours of what? Because like when I say 10,000 hours, like I imagine it would mean like I have to be sitting down with my music stuff for 10,000 hours actually doing the stuff. Actually, that's silly, because if you had to devise a program of education for somebody to become a creator, what would you put in? You'd put in, like for the music one, you'd put in like listening to music over many years. You'd put in reading interviews with artists who you admire. You'd put in... Uh, like the bit where I played recorder at school, even though I didn't really like it, and the bit where I played clarinet at school, even though I hated it because my mum told me to practice, didn't like practicing, it was boring. Uh, you'd also put in like any experience of like literature and art and like wandering around art galleries, wondering why people made this stuff, because that's all part of a creative kind of education. And then you get 10,000 hours much more easily and you can actually rack up the 10,000 hours. But once I'd done that, I then thought, oh my God, then I've fallen into the trap of trying to say I can do 10,000 hours, and it's not even about that, it is about just doing it and enjoying the process. So, finally, if you received my email about this thing, you'll know I spent a long time 
trying to draw a pear in PowerPoint. It's not easy. Um, but I got there in the end. Um, for some reason, thinking about a body of work, I think of a fruit. A plump pear seemed like the most appropriate one. Um, and the thing about a body of work is like, you don't have to worry quite so much about each of the things. Every time you're making a thing, you worry about each of the things and you want to make it perfect. And that's fine, because you want to treat it with love and care and make it nice. But overall, you're building up a body of work. So it's like the collection of things. Again, it's a bit like the side projects thing, because it kind of takes the pressure off. You don't have to worry quite so much about making this particular thing perfect, because it's about the body of work. Over time, you build up a set of things, and you can say, I, you know, here I am, I made this here, and here I am, I made this here. And these collectively add up to a nice bunch of stuff. I'm going to play my third <laughs> uh, track. And this is the one that I like best and have most fun playing, so I hope you are happy with this one. <laughs> uh, da -da 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 -da. I have to load it in. We're doing okay time-wise? Okay. Uh, right, I can do this one. Let's begin with... I like this sound, I could play with this for hours. We can also have the bass. The bass is nice. and the difficulty and yearning and not wanting to stop
Yay. <laughs> Okay, I don't have to play you any music anymore, which is a relief for me, <laughs> and maybe a few too. Um, I mostly failed to use this microphone, but there we go. Uh, I want my clicker. There's my clicker. Right. Last thing is a reading. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, so like reading from a book, that's a terrible idea. But I had to, because I don't normally just like, you know, read things out, because nobody wants that. But with Anthony, who's there at the back, there he is. He was my producer at uh, Orange Land Studios, where I recorded the audio book of this book last week or the week before. Um, Anthony was very nice. Uh, and there's one bit I'm going to read, right? And it's like two pages long. <laughs> this is like an exercise in doing things that you don't necessarily want to do and which nobody asked you to do but you very kindly came so thank you um, and so uh, most of the book is um, it's lots of things about creativity it's not so much creativity tips it's more kind of thinking about the kind of whole philosophy about uh, how to keep going creatively essentially and why people do things and uh, lots of stuff about creativity. But in the middle of it, on page 105, which is about halfway through, um, it's in the middle of talking about something completely different. Uh, I, in fact, it's talking about Brené Brown, who talks about vulnerability. But then it says, we'll come back to Brené Brown shortly after a brief discussion of the second The X-Files movie that nobody likes. Um, and then it says, there's a heading, and the heading says, oh, no, not that. The heading says, a brief discussion of the second The X-Files movie that nobody likes. So most of the book isn't going on about a film that nobody has seen or wants to see. I like but, it too. Okay, yeah, I know, I like it too. <laughs> it's fine. I like it. It's, it's good. Um, but so that, that's what, I, I, that's, I'm, I'm just going to read it out, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Uh, this, this amounts to about four or five minutes of reading, okay. The second movie that developed from the X-Files TV series was called The X-Files I Want to Believe and came out in 2008, six years after the, after the original TV series ended. Most people weren't that bothered. They might have liked it if the movie had invited them to enjoy an exciting story about aliens, a key thing that people enjoyed about The X-Files. It did not. Instead, there's a grisly main plot about a sort of Frankenstein doctor working with a man who is getting new body parts for his ill husband. So he's acting out of love, which is nice, but this involves having screaming people in wooden boxes about to have their limbs chopped off, which is not. There's a Catholic priest who's a paedophile who has visions about this case, which is why the FBI brings in Mulder and Scully, the X-Files people, who don't do X-Files things anymore. Don't know about an actual book, look, physical, made of paper and everything. It's amazing. Um, Mulder is in sort of hiding, and Scully has gone back to being a doctor. If you don't know anything about the X-Files, don't worry. It's all, it's all self-explanatory. But they live together and are a couple in a slightly melancholy, mature relationship kind of way after all those years and all the things they went through, see uh, 202 preceding TV episodes. That re and a movie, yeah. This is the second one, I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that representation of a grown-up relationship is nicely done. Then there's a B-plot about Scully, being a doctor, seeking a treatment for Christian, a boy who is dying of, an of a probably incurable disease. Probably incurable disease. That's the kind of phrase which me and Anthony spent ages over with me going, <laughs> prob <laughs> prob prob no, you know, uh, we got through it in the end. Christian is the same age that William would have been. William is the son of Scully and Mulder, who they had to give up for adoption for his own safety. This adds to Scully's concern for him and to the sadness. The boy with incurable disease story sounds like a corny trope from a daytime TV movie taking the easiest possible route to upsetting you. Which may be true, but it's still almost unbearably moving. The movie's subtitle, I Want to Believe, is actually relevant as the film is about faith and wanting to keep going and not being sure, which are wonderful components for a movie, unless, of course, you're expecting the exciting aliens and all that. Scully has to decide whether to go ahead with a new, highly invasive, 
very untested surgical procedure which might save the boy or could just prolong his suffering and that of his mournful, uncertain parents. And the religious establishment at the Catholic hospital is all lined up against Scully's experimental procedure. <laughs> <coughs> Meanwhile, back in the main plot, Scully is trying to persuade Mulder to give up, ironically, on the whole paedophile priest having visions thing, which she considers an irrational way to solve crime. But then the priest turns to Scully, wild-eyed and for no obvious reason, and says, don't give up. Exactly. <laughs> You've studied this closely. Haunted by these words, but also furious and disgusted that her own well-ordered choices have been thrown into confusion by a paedophile priest, Scully resolves to try out the new treatment. But when she meets the boy's parents, they tell her to stop. We think that Christian's been through enough. They have a bit of respectful conversation about this, but then Scully blurts, like a woman drowning, what if it did work? What if we found we'd made the wrong choice by stopping? Christian's mother asks if this means she can save her son. Scully replies, I'm saying I don't want to give up now. This feels to me like the raw heart of creativity, tumbling into something, unable to stop, not knowing what's right, whether to continue or how, but keeping going and hoping for the best. And sometimes listening to weird advice and then wondering why you listen to the weird advice. Given the high stakes, this all causes Scully to freak out. She loathes the paedophile priest, but what if he is right? What if even, after years of begging forgiveness, he is communicating a message from God about the boy? She visits the priest, furious, and demands to know why he had said, don't give up. He doesn't know, and unhelpfully has a seizure. <laughs> all of this is painful and heartbreaking. In the end, of course, Scully does not give up, and as the film closes, Spoiler. She is going ahead with the surgery. We don't get to find out what happens, but we have faith in her ability and her courage. Most of our creative quandaries do not typically have life or death consequences for sweet-faced children, but I really appreciated the intensely felt agonizing about what to do in this film, unlike in most movies, where a dangerous decision is almost always resolved by choosing to go for it in less than five seconds. And I like the seriousness that this film attaches to the uncertainty and the difficulty and not wanting to stop. It says something about the complexity of creativity as well as the subtle, tough choices of life in general. And then we go back to Brené Brown. That's that. <laughs> Thank you. I also said in the list of supposed entertainments for this thing that um, we could have a Q&A. How's the time going? I don't want to keep you too far away from the cheese and the wine, which we generously purchased for you. It's only 7.16, so we could do a little bit of Q&A if you like. Um, Q&A suggests that the A means that I've got the answers to your questions. I may not have the answers, but I welcome your questions or thoughts or anything, and we can see what we can do with them. And we've got a hand right there. Hi. Uh, I know that guy. Pleasure to be here. Hello. Thank you, Jay Board. Wow. Um, like you guys know, I'm very passionate about making music, um, especially in the traditional world, and sharing that with people who also enjoy that. Um, how much of this book is uh, related to that philosophy of making music connected? How does that relate to creativity? Um, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate your question. And I know that you can actually play guitar in front of people and not feel too embarrassed, so that's very good. Um, well, Making is, Making is Connecting was a book I did before everybody, not available for sale today for 2340, whatever it is. But, uh, <laughs> but funnily enough, now I mention it, the book Creativity is available for that. Just definitely. Anyway, um, yeah, Making is Connecting was a more kind of sociological book, which was about the power of making and the way in which it can bind people together and help people to form communities and understand something about their lives through making as a kind of commentary on that. And then I was pleased to see that some people sort of seemed to use it as a kind of inspiration for their actual creative lives, which was nice, like you, so that was nice. Um, but that hadn't exactly been the idea. So then the idea of this one is actually to actually be addressing creators and people who make things and to be talking about that head on, which is what it does. 
So they sit side by side like that. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Abby Gamble. Hi, Abby Gamble. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. I've always been an electronic music kind of person. Um, uh, well, it's the, it's the one that you can do, isn't it, as a, uh, without having to learn instruments and things. But also, I, well, I always liked electronic music anyway. And, and then it was exciting, the fact that you could actually make that, because it's like, oh, yeah, you can actually cause this to happen yourself, not just listen to other people's stuff, but make your own stuff. It seemed amazing. So, uh, yeah, so I was excited to be able to do that. Um, the original inspiration is the Pet Shop Boys, as mentioned, they didn't even like the Pet Shop Boys. Uh, and, and lots of other people as well. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, to try to come up with another bit of answer to it, it's that kind of democracy about the fact that it's, it's accessible to people to be able to do that, and I like that fact about it. Though obviously you're trying to do something that's not the same as what everybody else does at the same time. And you taught yourself in the Oh yeah. Uh, I'm pressing buttons and seeing what happens as well. Yeah, <laughs> trial and error. And um, yeah, God bless the YouTube tutorial. But I'm actually too impatient for YouTube tut tutorials as well. So I watch like three seconds of like, oh, I know what I'm doing now. And I don't, but you know. Uh, YouTube tutorials are amazing though, but I don't actually watch them. I just look at two seconds of them and then carry on. But thank you for that. Bernice. Of a fashion, yes. <laughs> What's your favorite mode of expressing your creativity? And two, is there anything that you've been thinking about learning or trying that you haven't yet? Oh, okay, really good question. Um, the one I enjoy most is the music one, but then that comes with the the thing that you don't know if anybody else is actually going to like that thing, and music's quite personal, so there's no particular reason to expect that they would like that thing, but it's disappointing if they don't like that thing, all, all of that stuff. But it's still what makes me most excited. And in, like, the weird thing about it, though, is like the kind of, when I'm making some of these sounds, I just think, oh, this, this is like objectively great. And obviously it's not objectively great. It just sounds good to me because it's exactly the kind of thing that I would like. That's why I'm making it. That, you know, it's a very direct correlation between what you like and what you make. Um, so then you can't really expect anybody else to like it or to understand your idea that it's actually good. Uh, but I also enjoy the fact that people aren't necessarily going to like it as well because it seems kind of slightly more combative than uh, just writing a book, which people probably quite like. Uh, the, the thing I should... Uh, what would I like to learn next kind of thing? Yeah, is there, oh. is there something that you thought would be an interesting to learn or try that you yeah. haven't touched yet? Okay. Uh, well, sculpture springs to mind. My music artist name is Sculpture Projects because I was like, yeah, yeah, sculpture, I've never done sculpture. I think sculpture would be rewarding, especially if it had kind of like uh, lichen growing up the side and seemed slightly ancient. But um, the actual answer is that after this evening, I'm just very glad when this is over and I'll go to bed and not come out again for about three years, I think. <laughs> uh, it's like, even doing music live, I'm not going to do that again. Of course. If you, um, if your purpose behind creating is to challenge yourself and to see things differently and to approach things differently and to ask different questions, for me, like, you know, I've been making music for 10 years. Yeah. Since you were one year old, amazing. Yeah. Yes. So that's Thankfully. Why, that's why I wanted. Ah, it's a good question. Thankfully, I'm easily distracted, so I can always end up doing something completely different instead. Hi, yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, when was your first song published? 
Oh, that was a great question. Um, published is a generous word for uh, this year, though. It was in, in the summer where um, I released my own stuff and also made CDs, CDs of it, even though nobody listens to CDs and you can probably barely remember what a CD ever was, but it's a physical product. I know your dad's got some of them. Yeah, I know. Well, vinyl would be nice. It's really it takes six months to do. I don't have that amount of patience. Um, yeah, so it was only in the summer. Thank you for asking. Um, and yeah, and I released it myself. So the, you know, the appetite for these things is low. But <laughs> I did my best. One more. Oh no, we've got hands now. Let's go at the back. That would just reinforce the thing about doing it. If doing, if just doing it is the only thing that is actually valuable for you as a person, then great. And AI is totally irrelevant to that because AI will add competing items onto the pile of products that are available in the world. But that's got nothing to do with you if you're focusing on just doing your creative thing and following your creative path and doing, you know, then the AI can be doing that, but it's just irrelevant to you. Um, and thankfully means I don't have to answer that question about you know, whether the AI stuff is actually good if it produces it or not, because you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I like stuff made by people. And if the most important thing is, as a person, trying to put your heart into making a thing, we've always got that as people, because we can always do that. And if there's also some computers trying to do that over there, then fine, but we don't have to worry about them, because it just literally makes no difference. So good. A nicely posed question, therefore. Thank you. Uh, Lorena, we'll make you the last one, then we can party. I'm sorry, Lisa. No, no, no. So, in your case, also doing research for this book, did you find an idea that would best challenge what you thought about creativity? Oh, um, undoubtedly, but what would that be? Um, what was the question? Okay. In the process of writing the book, uh, did I come across an idea of what uh, that would challenge my idea of? Uh, how to go about things. Um, I think my main shift has been ever more into the, I mean, this is repetition really, but ever more into the thing about process and just doing it and not worrying so much about the final outputs. Because we always think about the final outputs, it's just the sort of default thing about creativity. You're thinking about, oh, this person made this painting, this person made this piece of music, and you admire them for that particular thing they made, and you want to know how they made it and all those things. There's a lot of focus on the outputs. And eventually realizing that, in a sense, that's just irrelevant. You can just not think about the outputs at all and just think about the activity of doing. Uh, that's the most powerful thing for me because it is the one thing that is actually rewarding and which you can all create for yourselves and actually do at any time. You don't have to worry about people's judgments about the end thing because we're not even thinking about the end thing. It's just the pleasure of the doing is the nicest thing. Which is a nice concluding note, isn't it? So good. Thank you all for coming today. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it.